It's true that Catherine of Aragon, or Catalina de Aragon, as she should be known from her native Spain, is certainly not a forgotten person. But her story, her full story, possibly is. She is best known as a rejected queen, as a deeply devout Catholic, and as a woman who died with unrequited love. But what else was Catherine? In this video, we're going to attempt to look further under the skin of Henry VIII's first wife. Catherine's story begins on the 16th of December 1485 at Alcala de Henares, northeast of Madrid. She was born in the Archbishop of Toledo's palace, the youngest daughter of Isabella I of Castile and Ferdinand II of Aragon. She was named for her maternal great-grandmother, Catherine of Lancaster, daughter of John of Gaunt. Her parents had come to their thrones after a tumultuous journey. Both had fought through conflict and battles, and Isabella had rejected offers of marriage that wouldn't have been in her favour. Instead, both of them contracting marriage secretly with each other in order to keep their respective territories. Unusually, Isabella keeping her own lands for herself. They had only one son and now four daughters, and so the foundation of their delicate balancing act between their kingdoms rested on the shoulders of just one male heir. Catherine's childhood was marked by moving from place to place. The Spanish countries were at war constantly with the Muslim Emirate of Granada, and as a result, home was wherever the Spanish monarchs were, following the fighting. Isabella insisted on her children being with her, and so the whole family moved when needed. We know that Catherine was present at the ceremonial conquest of Granada on the 2nd of January 1492, and it's obvious that the city was extremely important to her. When it came time for Catherine to go abroad and marry, she chose for her personal emblem a pomegranate, which in Castilian is Granada. Importantly, this childhood would also have been the foundation of Catherine's faith, something which became so important to her later. Her parents were devout to a fault, and this was sharpened against the contrast of the Islamic faith of the Moors. When Isabella and Ferdinand took the city of Granada, they also took control of the city's mosque, rebranding it as a Christian church. The private home of a leading Moor also changed, becoming a Franciscan monastery. Granada would become the symbol of Ferdinand and Isabella's Christian crusade, a triumph of their faith over that of the Moors. It's little wonder that Catherine would cling to her religion as an adult far from her homeland. But a far more palatable part of Catherine's upbringing that remained with her throughout her life was education and culture. Determined that Spain should be as up-to-date as the rest of Europe, Isabella and Ferdinand invited scholars from across the known world to sit in their universities, commissioned artists to paint not only their own portraits but those of their children as well, patronised detailed tapestries for their palaces, and encouraged music and dancing. Isabella's own education had been, quite normally for a girl when she was young, lacking in many respects, and she was certain she would not allow the same for her children, including her daughters. Not only did her son, Juan, receive a full education in languages, mathematics, literature and the classics, but so did all of her daughters. Catherine would in years to come repeat this with her own daughter Mary. However, despite this culture and education, Catherine would still have grown up in the knowledge that her destiny, ultimately, was to become the perfect consort to a royal or noble suitor and that her duty would be to make heirs. Sometime after 1486, Henry VII of England began to float the idea of a match between his firstborn son, Prince Arthur, and a Spanish princess, namely Catherine. 
From Henry's point of view, he needed allies to cement his fledgling reign, and Spain was a good choice against the old enemy of France. Likewise, Ferdinand and Isabella had their own faltering relations with France and favoured an alliance with England for the same reason. By late 1487, the Spanish monarchs had agreed to send ambassadors to England in order to discuss a marriage, alongside trade relations and a political alliance. Finally, on the 30th of April 1488, they gave their ambassador Rodrigo González Puebla the power to negotiate specifically on a match between Catherine and Arthur, but the marriage negotiations were interrupted by a pretender to the English throne, Perkin Warbeck. Anxious about the young man's pretensions to the crown their daughter was to marry into, Ferdinand and Isabella wanted him out of the way and neutralised. When accused by Henry VII of harbouring Warbeck, they quickly organised an investigation into his true origins, revealing to the English king that Warbeck was apparently nothing more than a Flemish man with nice manners. They also tasked their daughter Juana with convincing her husband, Philip of Burgundy, to distance himself from Warbeck. Finally, on the 19th of May 1499, Catherine and Arthur were married by proxy, Puebla standing in for the bride. However, both of Catherine's parents were adamant she would not be sent to England until Arthur was at least 14, and at the time, he was just 12 and Catherine was 13. There was also something of an argument over the dowry and money in general. On the one hand, Ferdinand and Isabella didn't want to spend a lot of money, but on the other hand, they also wanted a lavish reception for Catherine's arrival. In 1500, a list of Catherine's proposed household of around 50 people was sent to England, but Henry tried to reduce it. Finally, in 1501, Catherine left Spanish shores for England, arriving in Plymouth in Devon on the 2nd of October. The first thing she did was go to a local church to thank God for arriving in one piece on dry land, which was understandable as her journey had been beset by delays due to her parents seeing off another war and treacherously bad seas. Clearly, she hadn't been expected when she did arrive, so Catherine wasn't welcomed by Henry's Lord Steward, Baron Willoughby de Brock, in Exeter until the 7th. She then began her progress to London, where she was joined by Henry and Arthur a few days later in Farnborough, Hampshire, on the 4th of November. Apparently, the Spanish ambassador Pedro de Ayala protested somewhat weakly that in keeping with Spanish tradition, Catherine should be secluded before the wedding. But Henry overrode this and replied he would see her even if she were in her bed before introducing his son to her. Little is known of the first impressions the young couple had of each other, but Arthur wrote to his parents that he would be a true and loving husband and that he was happy to behold the face of his lovely bride. They then left and allowed Catherine to enter the capital city alone on the 12th to rapturous crowds and lavish pageants for her honour. She represented an alliance with Spain, now one of the wealthiest and most powerful monarchies in Europe. On the 14th of November, the marriage finally took place at St Paul's Cathedral although the couple struggled to understand one another. They had written letters to one another in Latin, but struggled to understand what the other said as they had learned different pronunciations. Although it would be several hundred years before it became the traditional colour for wedding dresses, both Catherine and Arthur were dressed in white, the bride in a Spanish style of gown. Following the wedding came a grand banquet, followed by something that would in years to come become a much-discussed point, the bedding ceremony of the young couple. It was quite normal at the time for a newly married royal couple to be dressed for bed, tucked in, and for this to be witnessed by courtiers. 
Arthur and Catherine would then have laid under the covers together and waited for a blessing from a priest, first for their bed and then for themselves. After this, the priest left, followed by the onlookers, and the young couple would be left alone for their wedding night with the assumption that consummation would follow. The truth of what actually happened could only be known by two people, Catherine and Arthur. Many years later, Arthur's various gentlemen attendants would state that he had joked the following morning about being in the mist of Spain, and that it was a good pastime to have a wife. These remarks would seem to settle the matter of whether or not the marriage was consummated, except that Arthur was unlikely to have admitted defeat, and these remarks were not repeated until many years later. Catherine was silent on the matter as expected of a princess, but unlike so many royal weddings before, including that of her own parents, there was no display of blood-soaked cheats the following morning. It may seem grotesque to us now, but such a display was proof of a healthy young couple who would create heirs for the kingdom and therefore stability. Years later, Catherine would swear she had laid with Arthur only for seven nights in their whole marriage and that sex had never occurred. There was then great discussion over whether or not Catherine should join her husband at Ludlow Castle in the Welsh Marches, as he was to return shortly after being married. Some of her entourage wanted her to stay in London to familiarise herself with her new country and learn English, but Henry took the decision that Catherine was to join Arthur on the 21st of December. The young couple seemed happy enough together, Arthur busy with council meetings and royal business, Catherine with learning English and learning the ropes of being a future queen. But in March, both of them fell ill with a sweating sickness, a flu-like virus with such intensity it was possible for people to die within a day. Catherine survived. Arthur did not. On the 2nd of April, 1502, aged just 15, the eldest son of Henry and Elizabeth of York died, taking the hopes of a family and nation with him. The problem now came of what to do about his youthful widow. Catherine's elder sister Isabella had been sent back home when she became a widow, but Isabella of Castile and her husband Ferdinand were determined to maintain the alliance between Spain and England. Almost as soon as they received the news of Arthur's death, they floated the idea of Catherine marrying his younger brother Henry. Henry VII and Elizabeth were also keen on the idea, and negotiations opened as they had for Catherine's first marriage. Neither side seems to have worried about the degree of affinity between Catherine and Henry, or in other words, no one cared that they had been sister and brother-in-law. On the 25th of June 1503, they were formally betrothed, but due to the age of Henry, who was still 14, there was room for him to pull out of the agreement when he came of age. The treaty for the betrothal assumed Catherine's marriage to Arthur had been consummated, and while this was agreed by Puebla, it was vehemently opposed by Catherine's duenna, Donna Elvira Manuel. However, it was agreed that covering all eventualities was best, and dispensations were sent for. These were eventually sent out, but they took a number of years to arrive in England, and it's possible there was some doubt over whether a dispensation could even be issued. But by 1504, the situation had changed politically. Isabella of Castile had died on the 26th of November, and while her eldest living daughter, Juana, was her heir to the Castilian crown, Isabella had left Ferdinand as governor of Castile, possibly because she did not trust Juana's husband, Philip of Burgundy. This meant Henry VII felt he couldn't tie himself too closely to Ferdinand until the situation in Spain became clearer, and just before his 14th birthday, 
young Henry rejected his betrothal to Catherine. However, she and her Spanish representatives were not told of this, which suggests that the king didn't really want his son to reject the marriage altogether, but rather to keep his options open. But with the death of Philip on the 25th of September 1506, and the disgraceful locking away of his daughter, Juana, Ferdinand's rule was cemented. Catherine had been allocated Durham House as Dowager Princess of Wales, the London property of the Bishop of Durham. As her dowry had never been paid in full, she was unable to claim her dower, a third of her late husband's properties and lands, and was instead given £1,200 a year as an allowance from the English crown. However, when Donna Elvira was sent away in November 1505, these payments grew ever more sporadic, and Catherine was forced to give up her lodgings without a proper chaperone present, and to live at court. She wrote constantly to her father, telling of the poverty Henry VII kept her in, how she was unable to pay her servants, and how she had even had to sell some of the jewels and plate which made up part of her dowry. Catherine also complained in 1507 that despite living in Richmond Palace with Prince Henry, she hadn't even seen him for four months. Eventually, she was told about how he had broken off their engagement by Puebla, and she complained bitterly about the ambassador as well. To help with this, Ferdinand also made Catherine an official ambassador for Spain alongside the others. Her letters, however, show hesitancy and are written in her own hand, showing she had no private secretary to help with these tasks. It must have been a highly stressful situation for a young woman in a foreign country with no control over her own future. In February 1508, this came to an end with the arrival of another Spanish ambassador, Gutierrez Gomez de Fuensalida, who came with instructions to get the marriage done. Negotiations were painful, and slowly, everyone started to believe that the marriage would never happen, and plans were made for Catherine to return to Spain. Only she remained firm, saying that she believed God meant for her to stay in England and become Prince Henry's wife. But by March 1509, even her stubbornness was wearing thin, and she was considering returning home to take holy orders as a nun. And perhaps this would have happened, except that Henry VII died on the 21st of April 1509. Prince Henry, now Henry VIII of England, gave instruction that in fact he had decided he would marry Catherine, and that the wedding should take place as soon as possible. He would claim it was his father's dying wish, but considering the way the negotiations had been going, it's far more likely it was his own idea. On the 11th of June, at the age of 23, Catherine was finally married to Henry, who was a few weeks shy of being 18, in a private ceremony in the Church of the Observant Friars outside Greenwich Palace. It was a very quiet wedding, different from the coronation that would take place a few weeks later on the 23rd. The coronation was a suitably grand affair, the route for the royal couple lined with gold cloth and tapestries. Henry led Catherine from the Tower of London to Westminster Abbey, and it was followed by grand banquets and festivities. Catherine had triumphed. Despite having nearly eight years of difficult and at times humiliating experiences, she had held fast to what she believed was her destiny. And at the time, she could not possibly foresee the trouble she would have with her new husband. He was young, tall, athletically built, handsome with red hair, intelligent, cultured and religious. In short, Henry seemed everything Catherine could have wanted in a future spouse. But, Hints of his real character started to show through. He publicly asked all those who had suffered injustices to step forward, but 
many of these were ignored after the wedding fervour wore off, and he imprisoned his father's two councillors and tax collectors, Richard Empson and Edmund Dudley, who were clearly scapegoats, having them executed quietly some months later. At first, the couple were very happy together. They found each other attractive, attentive, and enjoyed being in each other's company. Shortly after her second marriage, Catherine at last found herself pregnant, leaving no doubt that she had indeed consummated things this time round. But the joy was to be short-lived. On the 31st of January, 1510, roughly six months into her pregnancy, Catherine miscarried a stillborn girl. However, she was informed that the child was actually one of twins and that she should expect the other child to be born normally. The news of the stillborn daughter was kept quiet, but of course, no other child appeared in the months after either. Catherine was no doubt made to feel even worse about her very public non-pregnancy when Henry started to chase after another woman, Lady Anne Hastings. But nevertheless, Catherine was still young, and it wasn't long before she was once again pregnant. Happy to silence critics who whispered she may not have been able to conceive again, Catherine also became more important in politics. Henry had been brought up on stories of kings going to war, including his own ancestors such as Henry V, but it left him with the desire simply to fight, and to fight France because that's what English kings did. Catherine was more astute in these matters, having been brought up by Ferdinand as her father, the master of political spin, and Henry looked to his pretty young wife to help him in unfamiliar waters. She became a true representative of Spanish interests in England, especially as her father sent her missives to pass on to Henry in her own way. Ferdinand and Catherine between them taught Henry how to conduct the subtle art of political subterfuge, not showing your true hand behind your smile. On the 1st of January 1511, Catherine finally gave birth to the much longed for son she and her husband wanted, a boy who would also be named Henry. To her joy, it was a healthy boy, and Catherine seemed to be doing perfectly well after giving birth as well. In London, wine flowed freely, there were bonfires, prayers of grateful thanks, and processions to mark the occasion. To personally honour his wife for giving him a son, Henry took part in a joust as soon as Catherine was able to appear again in public after her churching, his horse's mantle embroidered with the letter K for Catherine. However, once again, tragedy would strike. Just a few weeks after being born, their baby son grew unexpectedly sick and died on the 22nd of February. The grief and shock must have been hard for both parents to bear and Catherine was heartbroken. But there would be time for more children and there were other matters of state. When Henry was absent on campaign in France between June and October of 1513, it was Catherine he put in charge of England's affairs. He made her governor of the realm and captain general, giving her the authority to raise troops, make appointments and had a council to do business with. This shows that Henry certainly trusted Catherine, not only on a marital level, but with his kingdom. But on top of this, Catherine was once again heavily pregnant. Thinking it was the perfect opportunity to strike, James IV of Scotland invaded on the 22nd of August. On the 3rd of September, Catherine instructed Sir Thomas Lovell to raise an army in the Midlands, and by the 8th of September, Catherine herself rode north with a reserve army despite being pregnant. On the 9th, Thomas Howard, Earl of Surrey, who was in charge of the Northern Army, defeated the Scots at Flodden. James IV died on the battlefield with many of his men, and Catherine sent a piece of his bloodied coat to Henry. 
she had proven herself a queen willing to defend the country she now called home. For the rest of her queenship, Catherine would prove, far from being a quiet queen sewing with her ladies, she was more than willing to be heavily involved in politics and war. Her own mother had personally warred against the Moors of Spain. So too did Catherine shape herself to be a warrior queen against the Scots and French. However, possibly because of her endeavours, Catherine once again miscarried a son on the 13th of September. A painful and sad pattern was to follow. The following year in November or December 1514, Catherine lost yet another child, a son who was stillborn. Henry's dalliances with other women continued and only grew with each lost child. By 1514, Henry's mistresses were now openly spoken of at court. Catherine herself was by now in her early 30s, and her youthful beauty had given way under years of stress and tragedy. To a lady settling more comfortably into middle age, if still attractive, carrying more weight after successive pregnancies, and seeming more worldly wise. But her prayers for a living child would soon be answered. She once again fell pregnant in 1515, although Catherine must have felt trepidation at getting her hopes up. But she carried to term and gave birth to a healthy daughter named Mary on the 18th of February 1516, a girl who would grow up to become England's first crown queen regnant. Catherine's joy at finally being a mother to a living child was unbounded, and through Mary's life, her mother would lavish love and attention on her. Shortly after Catherine was able to once again come out into public view, she was given the news that her father Ferdinand had died as she prepared for birth on the 23rd of January 1516. Catherine genuinely mourned the loss, having more trust in her father than she should have, and his grandson Charles, son of Catherine's sister Juana, would take his place as ruler of Aragon and indeed all Spain as he kept his mother incarcerated. He was Catherine's link to her homeland, and in years to come, the scrawny 16-year-old would become his aunt's biggest supporter. Catherine would remain passionate about education, and this continued for Mary as well. While she had come to the English court knowing only French, Latin and Spanish, Catherine had since become fluent in English. She also helped look after the interests of Queen's College, Cambridge, and interceded with Henry to protect Lady Margaret Beaufort's, his paternal grandmother, benefaction to St John's College. She was also described in glowing terms by Erasmus for her academic knowledge at the court. It was also Catherine who helped provide much of Mary's early education, also engaging the Spanish humanist Juan Luis Vives for advice and to write The Institutione Feminae Christiane, a book on education for young Christian girls. He praised Catherine in his foreword as a model of maid, married woman and widow. By the age of nine, Mary could play music on several instruments, wrote and spoke Latin, and also spoke Spanish, French and possibly Greek alongside dancing. Under Catherine's own pursuit of education and that of her daughter, it became fashionable to educate daughters openly, largely due to Catherine's influence. Despite his disappointment at not having a son yet, Henry doted on Mary and often boasted about her accomplishments. She inherited her father's complexion and red hair with pale blue eyes. But Catherine would only fall pregnant once more in early 1518 and would give birth on the 10th of November that year to another stillborn daughter. It would be her last pregnancy. But there were still other queenly duties, and a year earlier in 1517, Catherine had spoke up for those who were imprisoned after the evil May Day. In early May of that year, 
distrust of foreigners in London erupted into full-on xenophobia. Fear of jobs being taken, women being stolen and food taken from the mouths of babes sound horribly familiar? meant that innocent, non-English people found themselves in fear of their lives. Thomas Wolsey protected his house with cannons and guards, the Portuguese ambassador escaped with his life after being attacked, and the mayor had lost control of the situation altogether. Henry was furious, and after troops were brought in to calm the situation, many of the rioters were hanged but about 300 prisoners, including 11 women, were not immediately sentenced. They were made to kneel before Henry, sat on a throne under a cloth of state, begging for their lives. Catherine apparently turned to her husband with tears in her eyes, knelt with them and also begged to spare them. So did many of the courtiers present, but it was the Queen who made the biggest impact. Of course, the whole thing had actually been engineered by Henry so that he could appear merciful without being weak, and they were spared to the great joy of everyone. By now, Catherine not only had to turn a blind eye to Henry's many affairs, but also to the illegitimate children such liaisons created. Only one illegitimate child was acknowledged by Henry, that of a son called Henry Fitzroy, whose mother was Elizabeth, or Bessie, Blount, who had originally come to court as a maid of honour in Catherine's household. By 1525, it became clear Catherine was not likely to bear any more children, and Mary was treated as Henry's heir apparent. She was sent to Ludlow Castle, much as the Prince of Wales traditionally would have been, although she was never officially given the title Princess of Wales. At the same time, Henry Fitzroy was invested as Duke of Richmond, a move many saw as a possible future path to the crown. Catherine appears to have made her peace with the fact her daughter Mary was the only heir to the English throne, Mary would simply need the right husband by her side, and while Henry played off French and Spanish sides by making and breaking betrothals several times for Mary, Catherine always favoured a Spanish Catholic husband for her daughter. Unfortunately for Catherine, while she had made her peace with the situation, Henry had not. In the same year as Mary was sent to Ludlow and England and France made peace, his wandering eyes settled on one of Catherine's ladies-in-waiting, the infamous Anne Boleyn. Anne Boleyn was dark-haired, attractive and alluring. She had spent much of her younger years at the French court, and her dancing, flirtatious behaviour and style of dress were exotic amongst the English courtiers. Anne was between 10 to 17 years younger than Henry, and while she was happy to flirt with the king, she didn't leap into his bed as his other mistresses, including her sister Mary Boleyn, had before. Henry began to believe, or at least publicly said he believed, that his marriage was cursed by God. Leviticus 18 stated that a man was strictly forbidden from sex with his brother's wife, and Leviticus 20.21 20, warned that such a union would produce no children. The fact that Catherine and Henry had a healthy daughter and plenty of other parts in the Bible had no issue with a widowed woman marrying her ex-brother-in-law doesn't seem to have mattered. For example, in Deuteronomy 21.5, it said a man should have a son with his brother's widow if a son had not already been born. While this didn't necessarily apply to Christians, it meant no one could be certain the Pope would agree Henry's marriage to Catherine should be annulled. Catherine was horrified at the suggestion that she should join a nunnery, and remarked, God never called me to a nunnery. I am the king's true and legitimate wife. Henry grew impatient with Thomas Wolsey, finding him too slow for the matter at hand. He instead bypassed his cardinal and sent an appeal to the Holy See. Things were made more difficult by the Pope at the time, Clement VII, being a prisoner of Charles V after the sack of Rome. 
many tried to stop Henry breaking with Rome. Martin Luther argued that the Bible did not allow for divorce, but did allow for polygamy at times, so why not simply take a second wife? The Pope even offered a dispensation for Henry Fitzroy to marry his half-sister Mary in order to secure the dynasty and allow for royal heirs. But Henry was too stubborn to believe the opinions of others over his own, too fearful that he would be the one who ended his father's fledgling dynasty by not having a son, and frankly, had also probably decided he wanted another wife by this point. Wolsey attempted to convene an ecclesiastical court in England in 1527 with a representative of the Pope, but Clement VII did not want the decision reached in England without him, and so he recalled his legate. Of course, the fact he was a prisoner of Catherine's nephew Charles may have meant he was influenced. Henry, by this point, will have seen that the Pope would never agree to an annulment while under Charles's control. Henry himself appeared before Wolsey to defend the validity of his marriage, but in May, the trial was adjourned while expert opinions were sought, never to be resumed. Catherine was never invited to defend herself and her marriage, but this meant she would easily have been able to appeal any decision made anyway. It seems more likely the whole trial was simply to lay the groundwork for a separation. On the 22nd of June, Henry made his feelings towards Catherine plain when he asked her for a formal separation. Obviously, she refused. Seeing her fury, Henry backed down, apparently saying he was only worried for his scruples. Catherine did not sit back and wait to see what would happen next. She immediately wrote to her nephew Charles, asking him to personally try and dissuade Henry from this course of action and to force the Pope to summon the case to Rome and revoke any authority Wolsey had. Anne Boleyn, meanwhile, was still having what could be described as an emotional affair with Henry, and still spent most of her time at court while resisting Henry's attempts to seduce her. She had made it clear that he could only have her as a queen, not as a mistress, and she had also refused his offer of making her an official royal mistress of the court. Not long after, Henry sent to Rome for a dispensation that would allow him, in the view of his marriage to Catherine being annulled, to marry any woman he chose, even within the first degree of affinity. While we would not think them related today, this referred to Anne Boleyn as her sister Anne had been Henry's mistress. He also commissioned various scholars to set out the case, most of them arguing that as Catherine and Henry's marriage was already against divine law, Pope Julius II should never have given a dispensation anyway. Henry also argued that, put into the original Hebrew, Leviticus's promise of childlessness only referred to male children. Convenient. And finally, that peace between England and Spain was a poor reason to give a dispensation. In short, Henry was grasping at any straw possible. Catherine, on the other hand, had just one argument, that her marriage to Arthur had never been consummated, and therefore she was Henry's legal wife in the eyes of God. The problem was that it was an emotional argument, and one that could never be proven. The Pope sent Cardinal Campeggi in October 1528, and under the seal of the confession, Catherine swore she had only slept beside Prince Arthur when she shared his bed, and nothing else. Popular support swelled for her. It wouldn't help, however. Henry was determined to have his way, and finally, in May 1529, a legatine court met at Blackfriars. Catherine appealed to the Pope for the case to be heard in Rome and appeared in person at the court on the 18th of June, noting for the record her denial of the impartiality of the legates and of the fact she had appealed to Rome. A few days later, on the 21st, both she and Henry appeared, the king setting out his case, and Catherine appealing for the honour of herself and Mary. Catherine stormed out of the court when it was clear which way the wind was blowing, despite a summons to return. 
Catherine was, however, at least for now, still queen. But she and Henry rarely spent time together, and when they did occasionally dine together, it usually ended in a furious row. To Anne's distaste, and that of this modern narrator, in June 1530, Henry was still asking Catherine to make his shirts. But finally, in 1531, Catherine was banished from court and Anne was given her rooms. On the 11th of July 1531, it was the last time Catherine and Henry ever saw each other. She was ordered to the Moor Castle in Hertfordshire, while Mary was to remain at Windsor, and Catherine would also never see her daughter again. By the end of 1532, Anne Boleyn was probably pregnant, and she and Henry married on the 25th of January 1533. While this is clearly bigamy to us, Henry arranged it with his new Archbishop of Canterbury, Thomas Cranmer, for his marriage to Catherine to be declared void in May of that year, and his marriage to Anne valid. The Pope excommunicated Cranmer and Henry for these actions. England broke away from the Catholic Church and Henry took on the position of head of the Church of England. Catherine must have been heartbroken, but she remained steadfast and stubborn even in defeat, refusing the title of Princess Dowager of Wales, willing only to be called Queen of England. She had to move to Buckton in Huntingdonshire with a severely reduced household. The majority of people in the country were on Catherine's side, including Mary Tudor, Henry's own sister. When Princess Mary fell ill in September 1534, Catherine begged to be allowed to see her daughter and nurse her back to health, but Henry refused on the suspicion his daughter might be whisked away to the domain of Charles V. Mother and daughter were not even permitted to write to one another, but there were plenty of sympathisers who were willing to risk carrying notes between the two. Henry offered better living conditions and freedoms to both Catherine and Mary if they would acknowledge Anne as the new queen, but both, unsurprisingly, refused. Mary was her mother's daughter. Throughout 1535, Catherine continued to fight for her rightful place, urging the new Pope, Paul III, to publicly publish Henry's excommunication. Whether this was because she still hoped to shame Henry into coming to his senses, or simply out of a sense of justice and rebellion, we will probably never know. Towards the end of the year, Catherine grew ill, and in late December, she took to her bed. Catherine could feel her death was near, and she wrote up her will. By the 6th of January 1536, she was severely unwell, and she wrote to Charles V to ask him to protect Mary for her. She heard Mass, and apparently wrote one last letter to Henry, professing her love to him, even after everything he had put her through. A cynic might wonder if Catherine hoped it would hurt him in her absence. The following afternoon, on the 7th of January, the rightful Queen of England died without the presence of her husband or daughter. The person who embalmed her body reported back that her heart was completely black, even though all her other organs were intact. It's very likely this was a cancerous tumour, but equally a suggestion at the time was of a slow-acting poison, which is what her physician chalked it up as. When the news was received by Henry and Anne, they didn't even have the good decency to act upset, instead publicly happy about Catherine's death. Henry was relieved as he thought Catherine's death meant Charles V would not go to war with him, and he and Anne wore yellow the following day, a colour which symbolised joy, parading their daughter Elizabeth around. Courtiers at the time were disgusted by the vulgar display. On the day of Catherine's funeral, Anne Boleyn miscarried a male child, something which was taken as an ill omen. As Henry refused to acknowledge Catherine as anything other than the Dowager Princess of Wales, 
She was buried at Peterborough Cathedral with little ceremony, and no monument was erected for her. Henry didn't go to the funeral, and he also forbid Mary to attend. Catherine was one of the strongest queens in British history, enduring a lifetime of tragedy with a brave and stubborn resolve. She was a Spanish infanta, along with her siblings a symbol of a united Spain. Catherine was a valuable bride, being the living embodiment of an Anglo-Spanish alliance not once but twice. She was a young widow, enduring years of uncertainty in the wake of Arthur's death. Catherine was also a loving wife and mother, doing nothing but her absolute best to fulfil these roles she believed were given by God, never giving up on either relationship. And finally, despite her rejection by Henry and her official downgrade to Dowager Princess, she was a Queen of England in every sense of the word, leading troops in battle to defend the kingdom, being politically involved in England's best interests as well as Spain's, being kind and generous to the poor of her marriage country, and leading England's educational and culture revolution through her own desire to learn. Hundreds of years after her death, Mary of Teck, better known as the wife of George V, had Catherine's status rightfully reinstated as a queen. Her tomb was upgraded, including now the title Catherine, Queen of England upon it, as well as banners declaring the same. Every year there is now a service in her honour at the cathedral, and her tomb is constantly decorated with flowers and pomegranates, her symbol. Perhaps then, in death, Catherine is given the honour and respect that her husband should have paid to her in life. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like and subscribe so you don't miss any new documentaries.